uh, we have an outstanding, and I pray someday even a more outstanding -er missions ministry through this church. Um, the things that happen through this little fellowship of ours up here in the middle of nowhere are quite staggering in um, the scope of what's going on. It's just not typical of a church this size. And we just expanded it again uh, financially. Uh, we just put more into it uh, because, frankly, we live in an area that tends to become very ingrown. I mean, you got to ask the question, why do I live up here? Because I want to get away from it all. So in order to keep us remembering that there is still a thing called the Great Commission, and that you got to get out there and preach the gospel and make disciples and baptize converts and the whole thing, that we um, uh, send, we have people that have been missionaries and will be again, these two back here working with the sound and everything. Uh, uh, so uh, they, you know, they were in Costa Rica for a couple of years, and they go back and forth, and, and they'll be doing it again at some point. And Jeremy's done missions. Uh, and have you gone with him on any of these things, that, crazy things that he's done? What's that? Right. He's, yeah, so he's been to the Philippines. You've been to Morocco. Uh, where else? Honduras, yeah. And, of course, I do all these weird things that I do, but they're all little missions. You go and you, you, you uh, support the missionaries or you, you, uh, you encourage them or you teach them or you just show up like with Kevin O'Neill, remember him, in Ecuador with a case of peanut butter because they can't get that in Cuenca, even though he's with the Lord. Now he's got all the peanut butter he wants. So, um, but uh, among the people that we support, and I'm glad that we're able to do this, is uh, Jim and Shonda Davis. And they have been in the Philippines and pretty much everywhere else in the world at one point or another. But uh, I've known Jim, um, I don't even know how long, since you had a ponytail anyway. So it's been a really long time. And we're finally starting to support pastoral training of Asia. And they, you've been involved in that for how long now? Since 85. Since 85. So we're talking, uh, you don't even want to hear this, but one, one year short of 40 years. That's, a, that's, that's what's called perseverance and faithfulness to a ministry. And he's going to tell us a little bit about that tonight. But I want to say this now in case I get so excited about what he says, I forget to tell you later, that if you would like to contribute to their ministry or just to the fact that they're here tonight, they have a table in the back there with all kinds of information on it, how you can support it. Just because the church sends them donations, sometimes one-time donations and sometimes other things, but they need all kinds of support. And it needs to be spread out because if you've got one church giving all the money and that church closes its doors or gets into financial trouble, then they're in trouble. So they need all kinds of support as well. And uh, it, even, uh, you know, like I say, if you'd like to give them something tonight in the way of a uh, check or, or anything, grab one of those envelopes behind the chair, stick it in there, and just write Davis on it. And we'll make sure that they get 100% of that, too, because we want to do that. And I'm telling you that in advance only because I'm really forgetful. So I don't want to forget that. It's too important. So with that, Jim, come on up and give us Jesus, man. All right. Bless you, my brother. God bless you. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'm very happy that we can come back again, and uh, God is so good. The, this morning we were in uh, uh, Calvary Chapel, South Lake Tahoe, and then uh, so we took that nice, uh, uh, what's that crazy toad ride in Disneyland? Uh, anyways, <laughs> from there to here, wow. And uh, a much greater for a younger person, somebody maybe half my age, or one of my grandkids probably would have loved to go on that zippy road. Uh, anyways, uh, God has been so good to us. And I shared a little bit last time I was here about the Philippines, and it's still a wide open country. People have open hearts. They want to know about the Lord. Uh, they're, they're religious, they're Catholic, most of them. Muslims are only about 5% uh, of the whole country, so uh, there's not that many Muslims, and they're open to the gospel. We've seen, we've seen two imams come to Christ, and one imam's wife come to Christ, going house to house with the gospel. And those are two pastors uh, going. And so uh, we've seen Muslims come to the Lord, too. And so many of the cultural minorities, all over Asia, cultural minorities are mistreated, looked down upon, taken advantage of. 
And so we work with a lot of cultural minorities. We don't use the word tribal uh, in the Philippines because that's, that's not a good word. It's like they're you know, not educated. So we say cultural minorities. You can say tribal in Thailand, and you can say tribal in uh, Burma. Every country is a little different. And we, as uh, Paul became all things to all men so that he might win them to Christ. So we try to understand the culture where we go so we don't just offend them right off the bat without even giving them a chance to know what we were there for. So we're, we, we always say, Lord, give us wisdom. Uh, we worked in the Philippines alone for, uh, for several years. I think it was five years. And then we, um, uh, uh, we started going to other countries. And so I want to talk about a, a few of those countries before I get into the Word of God and hopefully encourage you tonight. Because the last thing you need to be is discouraged. And the Bible says, cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. So he, you're important to him. He loves you on your best day. He loves you on your worst day. Now, how can that be? Because you've been bought with a price, not by silver or gold, but by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So you're valuable. You have intrinsic value. That's not based on what you can do or don't do or, you know, your skills, your talents. It's based on, on God's love and how he sees you. For God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. Not that he so loved, God so loved Republican Calvary Chapel people, but for God so loved the whole world. That's everybody. Everybody. Every social economic group, uh, every group, Hindus, Muslims, uh, gays. God loves them all. And he wants them to be saved. And uh, how are they going to be saved? We must love them. If we don't love them, how are they going to come to Jesus? I got saved because people came to me as a hippie, drug addict, a couple uh, people, and they just loved me. Yeah, I remember uh, them sitting there, and, and, and I was smoking dope, and they were sharing Jesus. And I looked at them, and they had more joy and more happiness than I did. That was back in 1969. And I realized they got something I don't have. And when I first, the first time I went to Calvary Chapel, it was in 1969, Costa Mesa, I was scared. My friend was supposed to meet me there, and he didn't show up, or he's late, I think. And I thought, what are they going to do to me? I hadn't combed my hair for three years. I used to have real curly hair, and I looked and smelled funny, and I didn't really know what they were going to do to me. But I went ahead and went in. Well, I know what, you know what they did to me. They came up and hugged me. Guys with suits and ties and, and you know, other hippie-looking Christians. Jesus freaks is what they call them. <laughs> and uh, they just loved me. I thought, well, this is wonderful. And so uh, that's what it's all about. It's loving sinners. And sometimes we don't even like them. I mean, if, we, if we're honest. But uh, Jesus said, love them. Love your enemies. You know, how do you love your enemies? He, he spelled it out. You bless, you pray, and you do good. And anyways, that's not my... So, uh, we start branching out. So I want to tell you a little bit about, and then I want to encourage you in the word, about Vietnam. We started going to Vietnam about 26 years ago. And the only way you can go in is tourists. You, can't be a, you cannot be a missionary. And when we first went in there, there was hardly no tourists. And there wasn't any, they call them Viet Q. A Viet Q is a Balak Bayan in the Philippines, someone coming back. So Viet Q is a Vietnamese person that moved somewhere else, became a citizen of America or whatever, and came back to visit their family and friends. And so there wasn't any of them around. And when we got into Saigon, they, uh, we stayed in many hotels. They were about 10 bucks a night. And, um, and then we'd work with the underground church. And on the right size, we couldn't, we couldn't get tall guys. They, they, we couldn't bring any of those guys in. But short guys like me could, could fit in. And we, we were wearing Asian clothing because we came from the Philippines. And then I just had to hide my, my features, my, my nose and, and uh, my eyes. So we wore sunglasses and masks. They wore them there because it was so dusty. And then, and of course, Shonda, we'd have to put almost a ski mask on her, a you know, full face one with everything because she's a total bust. And then, uh, you know, and then go into these underground church meetings. And uh, you do not come all at once. You go in immediately. No one hangs out at the door. And you go in, they close the door, and they'd call it soft praise. And so they'd get up. They'd be so excited, especially when we did our pastor's meetings, because they hadn't had any fellowship like this with other pastors. And they're so hungry. Communists closed down all the Bible schools in 75. And on top of closing them down, they took a lot of the prime property. And one church, they, because he preached Revelation, and he preached that there was communism was a dragon, so they, they arrested him and threw him in prison. They took the church. It was one of the main churches in Saigon. It was actually Bush Senior, senior that got him out of prison. And, uh, and he came, he's in America now. 
But so it was, it was something. And, you know, I was really emotional when I f- went there because that's my generation. I didn't go to Vietnam, but I have friends that did. And uh, so it was very emotional and uh, just being there. And, hey, the war's over. And sometimes you have to tell people that uh, because it's a long time ago. Stopped in 75, but there's a lot of effects. We have a, a Calvary Chapel pastor that's got horrible effects of Agent Orange. He was in transportation. And so he transported lots of Agent Orange. And he's all crippled up, got all kinds of other... And we have other friends in Calvary that have had bad effects. From it. And you know what? It's still there. And they're, they're, you'll see fields, and they'll say uh, uh, near, near uh, let's see, Coochie Tunnels, they'll say, don't walk out in this area. Big signs in, in Vietnamese with skull and bones. And so, uh, and every rainy season, the first of the rainy season, most of the people, if they can help it, they don't want to go out because all that gets recycled. And I was there when that happened once, and I got a rash all over my back. My pastor friend, Vietnamese past, he had to pull over on his motorcycle. He was about ready to pass out just from the effects of, of the, it coming back into the system. And so, um, but we, I, I remember teaching the first time we did it. Everyone, all these pastors, they were so happy to be together, they started singing too loud. And the kid, somebody called it soft praise back then. Someone would come up and go like that. Imagine that here we're trying to get people, right? Hey, come on, wake up. Hey, come on. Hey, come on, folks. Let's praise God together. You know, and just, you know, get people involved. Over there, they go, oh, keep it down, keep it down. And the cops showed up. We're on the third floor. Somebody told us. And everybody just prayed, started praying. And uh, unfortunately, we had to go to a different venue every, every day. We lost a few people. But uh, God blessed, but that was my, my introduction. And they were able to stave off. They said, where, where are all these motorcycles? Well, these are people doing, they're off doing this and that. And they were able to get rid of the cops. We got caught once in all the time that we were there. And uh, what happened is uh, it was probably too much out in the open. And uh, the cops showed up. And we had, we had about 35, plus we had, uh, they call them Montagnards, the, the French Mountain, these are the tribal pastors. And they don't, even watch, they don't even want outsiders to meet with them because they have persecuted, killed them, mistreated them horribly. And they were in that meeting too. And so as soon as our friends saw that, when we saw the cops, out, I wanted to run out the back door. There wasn't any back door. And where could I go anyways? Can't hide. I mean, I just stick, stick out in the crowd. So um, they said, start teaching English. So everybody put their Bible in their purse or in their bag, and I started teaching English, and I taught English for two and a half hours. I'm not an English teacher. <laughs> Forehead, eyebrows, eyebrows. I, you know, I just did everything I could think of. Finally, they were waiting for their captain to come, and when he showed up, he came in and took everybody's ID, took pictures of everybody, took their passports, and we were interrogated for two days. And they were very um, civil, and I said, my wife's blind, could we stay together? And they said, sure. They even let us take a nap the first day. So that was nice. And uh, they'd ask the same questions over and over and so forth. And, and then it got really interesting because he said, uh, you know, what's, what's your religion? I said, well, I'm a Christian. What church you go to? I said, and they're writing it all down, Calvary Chapel. <laughs> they go, uh, so what do you believe? And I started to sit here, and they gave me paper and pencil. So I, I wrote down the plan of salvation. And it, he was the, um, the chief of, immig- he was an immigration officer, and the other guy was the chief of police. He couldn't speak any English, the chief of police, so he was telling him everything. And so I gave it to him. And so he's reading it and translating it into Vietnamese, and he says, what's heaven and hell? And so I explained it to him. He, and he said, what is sin? And I told him. He said, uh, what's the forgiveness of sin? You know, it was like, after a while, I started, I didn't want to smirk and start laughing, but... I mean, rejoicing, you know, doing a hallelujah dance because you guys are hearing the word of God. I mean, it was like, it was just, it was right out of the, right out of the gospel. Don't, the Holy Spirit will give you the words. Don't worry what to say. I'll give you the words. And so we got to share the gospel really clear. And so uh, that was wonderful. The second day, uh, they, they were going to formally charge us for teaching English without a license. And, uh, and, of course, then they take away your, your visa, and you can't come back, and they fine you. And I said, but we said, look, we'll, we'll never, and they said, well, uh, we, they made us swear that we'd never do it that way again. And my child goes, we'll never do it that way again. <laughs> so anyways, and uh, the definition on that. Anyway, so uh, we signed the paper and said thank you, and then instead of going up to uh, Kantum, which is in the mountains, 
uh, we went to Da Nang, and I uh, was able to uh, give a greeting to a, uh, to a registered church uh, for, uh, let's see, it was about 30 minutes. Yeah, that was my hello, y'all. But it was, you know, it was really a sermon. But uh, if the cop showed up, then they would let me know. And I'd say, well, it's just nice to say hi to y'all. God bless and sit down. Um, some of the tribal people were horribly mistreated. Uh, one of them, the first, some of the first tribal people we met, there's 53 cultural minorities in Vietnam. 53 cultural minorities. The ones in the north are uh, Chinese in their language groups. The ones in the south are Malay Polynesian. So it's almost some of the same words in the Philippines. So we found it real interesting. We, we, could, we knew some of the words and uh, made it uh, quite interesting, you know, for these people. Um, this, uh, this one tribe, the, the wives would ask the husband for marriage. And uh, that was in uh, Bunmatu. And uh, uh, so that we thought that was interesting. And uh, they, this older pastor, I said, so did your wife ask you? He says, well, we were converted to Christianity, and so we changed a little bit. Uh, but, uh, and so, but it was that's the way it was set up in that, in that, in that tribe. And uh, we found that quite uh, fascinating, and all the different culture. Uh, one uh, pastor, he gave his testimony. Uh, he got converted through FEBC, uh, 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 FEBC. A Far Eastern Broadcasting Company. It's one of the oldest Christian broadcasting companies. And they want to put a radio station in our mission center for free. And they want, to, they want to staff it and everything for absolutely free. And so please pray for that because there's a, a shortage of frequencies. And um, but they're, they're ready to go as soon as they get that, that frequency. So uh, this, this tribal guy was listening to the salvation and he received Jesus. And so he went around and got other uh, members of its tribe to come to his house and listen. And he became their pastor. And so what they would typically do is not only uh, preach the gospel, but they would read scripture at dictation speed so you could write it down. You see? And so he, he would do this. And so he got, he got letters in the uh, gospels and he had his own little handwritten Bible. And uh, this guy was just really incredible. And he said uh, they had to be very careful because the police... Any kind of activity, they're all looking. There's, there's no electricity in that area. And he said that he, would, he was going out to get some, some uh, new people. They wanted to come. He wanted to go see, why are they still coming? And so he went out on the trail, and for, he brought a flashlight, but he said, I didn't want to turn it on. But he felt like, I really need to turn it on. It felt like the Lord said, go ahead and turn it on. So he turned it on, and right on the trail was a king cobra, and its head was almost right, right where his face was. He would have bumped right into that thing. And so he shouted out to the house nearby, and they came out with a big machete and, and, and killed it. And he said, the Lord just protected me. He said, and he told me to go ahead and turn that light on, and I did. And, and uh, God protected me. So we had incredible stories. One cultural minority, he was a um, pastor, was in our group. He looked like my grandson, Noah. He had curly hair and very smiley. But he had disfigurement. His eye was almost gone. Uh, he was in a little village, and, and the church was growing. The, the police hated them because, first of all, they're different. They look different. They, they have different language. And uh, so they don't like them. And uh, he had all these people were coming to Christ. And finally the cops showed up and they said, you need to stop this. And uh, we don't want this. And, and, but he continued. And so they came and they, they beat him up really bad. And they burned his house down. And so, um, uh, but he, 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 he just thought, oh, what can we do? And then so the, the, the people, the leaders, they said, Pastor, you, we don't want you to get hurt. Why don't we just have meetings in our homes? So they started meeting in their homes. And they don't have any doctors, medicine, but they read in the Bible about healing. So look, why can't we pray and ask for healing? So they did, and all of a sudden people are getting healed. And it got spread out. So as soon as that happened, everybody in town's talking about it. Not that it's the Christians, the non-Christians, and they're mostly animist, most of the tribal people. And so it became, it became big news. So the cops came again. again. And they really beat him so bad. And his wife was uh, seven months pregnant. They kicked her so much uh, in the stomach she lost her baby. And so uh, it was horrible. And they, uh, they said, Pastor, we love you so much, but we're going we're gonna to ask you, I think you need to leave the community. We don't want you to get killed. That's when I met him. He was in between. And, uh, and so that's what he did. But that church just kept growing. And he, I found out a year later he was in another area with his uh, language group, and he started another church. They just simple, they believe God, and they don't stop. So um, we're always concerned. We did some projects in Vietnam. 
Uh, one of them was uh, Pastor Chuck got behind one. We had a way to get Bibles. They had to have the official sticker. And uh, I have a book right here with an official communist sticker on it. <laughs> this is the book I wrote on marriage and family in Vietnamese. And I got an official commie sticker. <laughs> Which means that I can carry a hundred of these anywhere in Vietnam and I won't get in trouble. We had an underground printing ministry because we believe in, in printing the Word of God. We had some in one tribal group. I couldn't remember it's Taru, Charu or Rai, Rai. I can't remember which language, but they showed it to me, and I opened a little booklet, and there was a picture of Ho Chi Minh. I said, why in the heck did you put, they call him Uncle Ho. Now, why did you put a picture of Uncle Ho in there? And they said, well, that's because of the, the com if the police catch us, they'll think it's some kind of a, you know, a, a government thing. They can't read this language. But if they see Bako, you know, Uncle Ho, then they think, oh, it must be okay. They, we never got in trouble with any of those little booklets. Because uh, that was the wisdom that God gave them, having a picture of Ho Chi Minh. Uh, I got my, this book in marriage done, which was great. I didn't know if I wanted to put my name on it, uh, but they said, no, no, it's no problem. So, because we were never formally charged, see? And this is just about marriage and the Bible, the Word of God. And we're hoping to do all of our books there in, in, in maybe this coming year. Well, I'm running out of time, so I'll quickly just want to tell you about uh, Thai Burma border. We work with the Karin. We've been doing that for about 26, 7 years. And uh, they're one of the Burmese cultural minorities. Like, uh, they just, uh, the Burman people, I don't know why, they just hate this group more than they seem any of the other cultural minorities. And they've killed them, raped them, burned, uh, tortured them, horrible things. And so 120,000 of them, uh, this is, these are old figures, have gone into the uh, Thailand in refugee camps. So we worked in the refugee camps. We worked in Burma, in refugee camps, and in Thailand, the villages. And uh, the Korean, beautiful, they have a belief that there were three brothers. The Burman brother, the Korean or Kayin brother, and a younger white brother. There were three brothers. They were all given books, special books from God. And there's little variations in the story. Well, uh, one of them was eaten by the ants, that means the termites, and one was lost. But the one, the younger white brother, took that book and he went away to a far country. They always believed that he would come back someday. That's what they believe. And one day, Adonai Judson, the Baptist American missionary, showed up in Burma. And, uh, well, to the Burmese, the white people, they all look the same, so they believe that he was a, a Brit. And he was part of that conspiracy to take charge of the country, so they threw him in prison. He said, I'm not a British, I'm American. And they threw him in prison, beat the living daylights out of him, just really horribly. But he paid his dues, and he got out. And the first village he went to was a Korean village, and they saw this white man, and they saw the golden book, see? He had a golden book. It was the gold leaf Bible. And they just said, it's the... Younger white brother has come with a golden book. And they got saved village after village after village. And, and just thousands came to Christ. And if you go there today and talk to the uh, Cayenne, the Korean people, they even have little pictures of Adonai Judson, you know, their missionary that brought them to Christ. And they, you know, so they, for us, we're the younger brother and sister. And they believe it. And this is what redemptive, we call this a redemptive analogy. Of course, this is what uh, Richardson, Don Richardson, and uh, uh, Peace Child taught about. And anyways, uh, that's, uh, we just love these people. We're just there. It's horrible things are happening right now in Burma. Please pray for the Christians there. The, the, the military is doing the same horrible things to the, all these cultural minorities. They're trying to fight back, but uh, they, the, the Burman military have all the big stuff. The, they have jets and tanks, and, and so... Uh, we had just one little story I'll tell you about um, in India. India is an incredible place. At one time, we had two families. And uh, one of them was, uh, well, that was uh, uh, Joe Valenzuela. I don't know if any of you knew the father. Uh, he was up in Gardnerville in Nevada. And this was his son, Joe Valenzuela. And uh, so, uh, anyways, we had seminar we've had seminars all over in India, incredible country. F one billion Hindus. Right now, today, well, over a billion Hindus that don't know Jesus. Isn't that incredible? A billion people that don't know Jesus. 300 million Muslims, and that's a minority. And we met this one lady, had a beautiful testimony. She was part of our salvation uh, our evangelism. We have them give their testimony. They write it out before Christ, receiving Christ, and after Christ. And she, um, she was, her dad was a Hindu priest. 
And one, one special week, he bought her a, a nice brand new dress and was going to take her to the temple, a special service. So she was so happy to go with her dad. And she got there, and there was no people, just the, the priest. And they went into the inner sanctuary. And uh, she said, Dad, where are the people? They said, well, they'll come later. And uh, they were, her dad was going to sacrifice her. And so uh, she didn't know what was going on. But I want to tell you something. She was witness to, uh, and she was about 9 or 10, by another girl in school, a Christian girl, told her all about Jesus. And said, Jesus is way more powerful than any of our Hindu gods. And he's not only more powerful, but he died for our sins. And he, he went to the cross and was crucified so that we might have our sins forgiven, so that we might go to heaven. And he is the son of the living God. And so she heard all this stuff from this girl in school, just an, another young girl. And so when the dad got up and got the sword and had her down and was about to slay her, she cried out, Dear Jesus, help me. And all of a sudden, everything in that temple, the inner sanctuary, started to shake like an earthquake. All the incense came falling down, the candles and stuff, everyone thing to the ground. And so they, they put, it, that's weird, so they put everything back up and, and, and got ready to sacrifice her again. She cried out to Jesus and the same thing happened. Everything just started shaking. And the incense and the candles all went on the floor. And the other priest said, no, nah, this is a bad omen, we, we, can't, we can't kill her, we can't sacrifice her. And so they didn't. And so that, that man cut himself, gave some of his blood, yanked her out, took her home, locked her in her room, no food, no water. And her mom gave her some, later gave her some water. And she was, you know, and, but she grew as a Christian. And, and this girl, she told her, and this girl was so happy. And she ended up just becoming a dynamic evangelist for Jesus. And she shares the Lord. She goes right up to any Hindu anywhere in the buses, in the, in the market. And she, of course, she, her and Chanda just love, love each other. But uh, pray for India. They've, they pretty much kicked all the Christians out, uh, foreigners. Uh, you, they just, we had a 10-year visa. They denied it. And so, uh, but that's okay because there's a lot of on-fire Christians there that need encouragement to go ahead and, and take it. So I'm going to really, I got, what do I got, five minutes? Okay. If you have your Bibles, please turn to, to Jude. <laughs> Jude verse 11. And uh, this is, I love Jude. It's written by the half-brother of Jesus, very humbly. He doesn't even say that. He just calls himself a, a bondservant, brother of James. And this is, but this is the half-brother of Jesus. He tells the saints, hey, you need to defend the faith. Why? Because there's so many false teachers coming. How do you defend the faith? You must know the faith. If you don't know the faith, how can you defend it? You see? You, you can't. You have to know the basic tendons to defend it. And that's why sometimes a, a Jehovah's Witness, they've only been a, a JW a year, and they can turn a Christian into a pretzel because they, they ask questions about the deity of Christ, the Trinity, etc., salvation. Some Christians, they don't, they don't have answers. But we need to know the Word of God to defend it. And then Jude talks about all these different ones that rebelled. He starts with the angels, and then he goes Sodom and Gomorrah, and then he talks about these men are dreamers, they defile the flesh. And then in verse 11, he says, Woe to them! They've gone the way of Cain. They've, they've uh, for money, they have rushed headlong into the air of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. So there's these three sins he talks about. And these three have something in common. They all, they all knew God, and they all were mature, all of them, all three of them, as well as you could be, and you, you could imagine. But they all had a problem. And so God he gave them, gives us a warning it's kind of like you give your kids a warning, don't run out on the street. That's not safe. Don't do that. Uh, I mean, and then you get a little older, we have other warnings. So watch out for salt. Yeah, watch out for sugar. Well, that's got a lot of sugar in it. Better not eat. Oh, that, look at the carbs in that. This morning we stayed up in, uh, salt, uh, up in Tahoe. They put us up in this fancy, dancy place. Wow. Free breakfast and all. I went in there and they had these donuts. Forbidden fruit. And Shana goes... One, one was a, what do you call that? A maple bar. Wow. So we cut it in half and shared it. Yeah, I call them colon busters. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I don't, we don't eat maybe one or two donuts a year, but boy, was that yummy. But see, here's the thing. <laughs> whoa. It's like, whoa. And it's for every big Christian, for young and old. What's the way of Cain? Who was Cain? Cain was the first one to be born natural on this planet. 
What did he do? He murdered his brother. Not an enemy, not some other tribe, not some other group. He killed his own brother, his younger brother. Why? If you read the passage, he had a really horrible attitude. And now the old translators, the old interpreters say, oh, well, his, his brother offered blood and he didn't. Well, if you read it closely, a little different than that. His brother gave first fruits and the fat. What did Cain do? He just gave some vegetable fruit, nothing choice. I picked a bunch of tomatoes where I'm staying. Some were kind of gushy and, you know, not, they're already overripe. Tossed them to the birds. Kept the good ones. He just gave what he had. But he had a bad attitude. And when God spoke to him, he says, why are you, what's wrong? You know, your face, you, your joy is gone and something's, and he challenged him. He said, you know what? Sin is crouched at the door. You better get a hold of your passions. And it's a picture like a mountain lion, like that poor lady in cool that was out jogging. We had a guy down where we lived that was killed on a mountain bike by a mountain lion. Just boom, to dead. Oh, they look like cute little kitty cats, don't they? They're killers. You know, they're, you know it's right, it's a, this is the picture that God gives, you know, gives his son. He says, they're right there. You know, you got to get a hold of your passions or they're going to control you and you're going to be in trouble. And what did he do? He didn't tell Adam. It says he told his brother. If he would have told his, his dad, if he would have said, Ad, Adam, I, God talked to me, and let me tell you what happened. I'm sure Adam would have said, son, you better listen. You better watch your attitude. You better, you better get, you know, you need to repent. You need to do this and that. But he didn't. He told his younger brother, and then he killed him. And so the way of Cain is jealousy, envy, hatred. Does it happen in the church among Christians? Yeah. Sometimes when somebody's blessed, somebody's jealous. Somebody gets envious. And, and, and pretty soon they don't like them. You know, somebody gets blessed with a beautiful home, nice new car, and we think, no, I, can't, I, should, I deserve that. That person doesn't deserve that. I've worked way harder than they have, or whatever it may be. And, and, and that's not good. And the Bible spells it out that we, we're, we're not to have that attitude, but we're to rejoice with those that rejoice. We had a pastor, when I, when I started as a pastor at Calvary Chapel Mission Viejo, it was a tough go. Most guys start on the surface. My friend said, you, you started subterranean. Uh, it was a church with all kinds of problems. And uh, uh, Chuck Smith's brother, Paul, uh, was interim. Now, he didn't want the church, but I came and he said, maybe we should just bury this and start anew. This church has got way too many problems. But I was real excited and motivated. That's ah, okay, brother. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we can do it with God's help. Yeah, sure. And we did, but it was painful. Real short honeymoon. But, the, but, but uh, anyways, so we were growing. There's another guy that I, I knew. He, he started a church at the same time. His just took right off. And then... They, they bought property and built this beautiful, big uh, church building. We were renting at the high school. And this guy was good looking. I mean, he was, he was a captain of his football team. And, and this guy was just, and then he, he bought uh, a lot right on my street. We had this old house. He bought this huge, palacious, he inherited a lot of money. This huge, palacious house. They didn't even have any kids yet. And he got a brand new car. And I had a car, it was one of these. Okay, put the brakes. And so he, man, that day, he, he drove by our house in that brand new car. And he waved. And I waved back. And you know, I didn't say it, but I was jealous. And I, I was envious. You know, of course, I'd never say that. Uh, and when the other pastors in the community got together, we'd talk about them. Backbite them. Oh, we wouldn't say we're backbiting. I don't know. His church is so big. He must have just allow all the sinners to come. He probably never preaches, the, you know, rebukes them. You know, he's just easy peasy gospel. And, and the, all the pastors were jealous in the community. And then the Holy Spirit spoke to me one day. You're jealous. Oh, well, that's not me. I'm talking about somebody else, right? No, no, you. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry, Lord. I repented. And then years after that, I told him, I said, brother, I was jealous. You could, you were just jealous. He couldn't believe it. I said, yeah, I was. <laughs> Not just me, but all, all the pastors I know in the community felt the same way because God blessed you so wonderfully. And instead of rejoicing, we criticize. And see, this is what, this is what we're, we're to guard our hearts. 
Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your hearts, for it is a wellspring of life. Psalms 51.10, David's prayer, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Yeah, we want to rejoice with those who rejoice. And God blesses my brother and sister. We need to be, hallelujah. Or say, God help me to be happy for them. Instead of criticize, instead of thinking that should be me. And uh, Arab Balaam, and quickly, let me go over this. Who was Balaam? He was a prophet of God. He came from the east. This was before things were quite developed. And he, uh, they called on him to come and curse Israel. The Canaanite people, they, did, they saw Israel as so big and demanding, they thought they were just going to wipe out everybody. And so they called him and said, of course, we're going to give you a love offering, they told him. <laughs> we'll give you your fee. And he was happy about that. But every time he'd go to, uh, to curse, a blessing would come out. He said, I can't. I can't curse him. God's, these are his people. And so they, they said, well, listen, we'll give you more. And even, he goes, well, even if you gave me a whole house full of gold, do you get the hint? Uh, maybe I could do something. Anyways, he really tried everything to get more dough. And so that was really his problem. Is he, he, this is most important to him, is, is getting a lot of stuff, a lot of money. And you remember the story? He's going and, and to curse, and, and God sent an angel with a sword. And the donkey, you know, stop. He's beating the donkey. And finally, the donkey turns around. What are you hitting me for? Don't you? <laughs> I love that story. Uh, if there's an instant replay in heaven, I want to put that one in and see it. <laughs> I doubt there will be, but maybe. Who knows? But anyway, so he, then God opened his eyes. He said, fell on his face, repented. I'm so sorry. And told the donkey, he was sorry. So, you know, what is it? It was uh, the Midianites, the Moabs, Moabs. And God wasn't even going to mess with them anyways. He wanted to go into the land. They were bypass them, but they all freaked out. And so uh, uh, he finally said, I can't curse them, but I can tell you how you can stumble them. These are holy people. The women are very modest because they don't believe in, in fornication, adultery, and they believe in holiness. You get some of the young women and men from Baal Peor, that was their sex god, and you get those young people half dressed, half naked, and put them into the, the with the, the children of Israel, and they will backslide. And that's exactly what happened. And they brought them again. These people had never seen so much flesh. They didn't have TV. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, they didn't have anything. They didn't see anything like that. And so they started backsliding. And Moses was crying out to God, and here comes a, a child of Israel running by with a half naked. Uh, uh, Moabitess. And then they ran right to the tent. And Moses, they're just crying. So uh, Phoebus got a, a spear, went into their tent as they were, you know, have doing it, and ran the spear through both of them. And God called them righteous. Because this is too much. 20,000 of them died because of that. And so the, what is the headlong, running headlong, it's abusing your position as a believer for unrighteous mammon. You know, or uh, unrighteous, you know, gain. People do it. Christians do it. Leaders do it all the time. We, do, we discover some of them go to jail because they've made money and put it in their pocket. I've seen it in Asia. Uh, advertising some ministry with children and really they're just putting it in their pocket. And sometimes, uh, uh, you know, the Westerners don't know what's going on. They just keep supporting. But uh, so we have, to be, we have to be on guard. It's loving money, money more than loving God. And so, uh, and it's really not how much you got. You can, you can, it's how much it's got you. You can be poor and have a problem with money. You can be a million, multimillionaire and not have a problem with money. It's not how much you have. It's how much it has you. It, it's how much it controls you. And um, I met poor people in Asia. That's all they think about is money. How can they get ahead? And Jesus said, no, man, no one can serve two masters. For either they'll hate the one or you'll love the other. Or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't serve God in wealth. Matthew 6, 24. Uh, 1 Timothy 6, 10, uh, 6, 10. For the love of money. Not money. Money's not evil. It's the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And so uh, this is it. This is what we take away. Is a, uh, Luke 12, 15, watch out and be on guard against all greed because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. And Hebrews 13, 5, don't be obsessed with getting more material things, but be relaxed with what uh, you have since God assures us 
I'll never let you down, never walk off and leave you. I love what Mother Teresa said. She was interviewed by a, a, a Western journalist for a week. He followed her around. And she's there trying to help these Hindus die in with some dignity. In India, if someone's dying, they're right in the street, it's horrible. And they're just dying, and people walk around them. And they, because they believe in karma and dharma, they believe, oh, don't, don't interfere because you might wreck it for their karma, and then they come back as a lower. But if they suffer and, and die like this, they might come back as a higher a being. And so it's a kind of a pathetic, horrible religion. And so she was there helping them die with dignity. And uh, this, this journalist, after a whole week, he said, you know what? I wouldn't do what you're doing for a million dollars. And Mother Teresa said, neither would I. <laughs> I wouldn't do it here for a million bucks. <laughs> Obviously, there's some things that, you know, are way beyond uh, some kind of material uh, amount you could put on it. And so uh, we, we need to be good stewards and, uh, and, and watch. You know, you'll never see a hearse with a U-Haul behind it. Can't take it with you. And so uh, I got some cool stuff. I got a saxophone my dad gave me. He was in a band in the 30s. It's a beautiful king tenor. I used to play it. No, not, not good scare the neighbor's cats. But anyways, I mean, you know, I, I, had a lot, I can't take it with me. None of this stuff. I'm not taking any of it. You know, and, and I, I learned from those Baptist Korean, they just give all the time. Even in the refugee camps, they're giving. And it'd make you cry almost. They'd come up and they'd make us sit up in front as the teachers and also my interpreter. And they'd come up and they'd give us offerings. One time, this one of the, because they just want to thank God. And I, I'm one, one of the Korean men, he went across the border into Burma where there's, there's mines. He could have been killed. He climbed up and got a bunch of wild orchids, came back, went into the Thai market, sold them, and he wanted to give an offering to the missionaries because he was so thankful that his family were safe in Thailand. He came in to our Nipah, so, you know, just one of these native places. As soon as he came in, the whole place started shaking, moving, because it's just bamboo. He got on his knees and came up and gave us this money. It was worth maybe $10 in U.S. and Thai money. And we're in tears. We're all in tears. We just turn around and thank him and give it to the missionary. But, you know, you know it's, the Lord loveth a cheerful giver. And you can never outgive the Lord. And so there's no pockets in those robes. Won't be taking our wallets or our, our uh, purses. And so it's a good thing. Uh, now, last of all, and I'm sorry I went over, and, and I'm sorry too, I got to run right after this because we're having a late dinner with our host over in Forest Hill. And so I um, apologize for that, but they've been so sweet to us, and they're, they're saving a meal for us. Um, the last one is the Rebellion of Korah. What did Korah do? It says gainsaying, King James, a gainsaying. I'm speaking against who? Moses. And who was Korah? He was a leader. He was a leader in Israel. A grandson of... Uh, Aaron, and uh, he came up to Moses and said, who do you think you are? You think you're the only one that can go to God? What did Moses do? He understood this rebellion. He fell on his face, meekest man, they say. And he cried out. He said, Lord, help me. This is rebellion. And he said, come tomorrow and we'll pray and we'll ask God who's his servant. So they came. Moses prayed. Here's Korah, prideful. Some of his tribe, they didn't want to come. They knew this was not good. But Koran came with all the other ones, puffy nose in the air. Moses prays. And the Bible says the earth opened up. And Korah and all those people, they fell alive into hell. And then the earth closed. And, and God judged them because they were speaking against. So does that happen today? Yeah, people speak against God's leaders. And we have to be careful. There's no perfect pastor, no perfect church, no perfect husband, no perfect wife. No perfect children, no perfect grandchildren, except a few of ours. But we're, we're all sinners. And I'm not excusing sin. I'm just saying that's the way it is. But if you, like they say, if you're looking for a perfect church, don't join it because you'll wreck it. And so, of course, if a pastor does something, you pray and, and, and go see him personally. But check out your heart that you're not prideful or, you know, it's, your, your, it's you. Uh, but we are, what are we to do? We to, we're to pray for our leaders, not backbite them. And um, 
Proverbs 29, 23, a man's pride will bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. James 4, 6, but God gives great, uh, greater grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Romans 12, 16, do not be proud. Instead, associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own eyes. So we need to pray for our leaders, guard our attitude and our thoughts and our heart. I've seen a lot of people uh, do that and criticize and, and cause so much problems. And, you know, it's just sad. But God wants us to pray and bless our leaders and, and, and pray God's blessing on them. And uh, so this is it. Well, uh, I, I went over and I apologize. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray your blessing upon it. May we learn from the, the way of Cain, the heir of Balaam, and the, the gainsaying of Korah. May we guard our hearts and our attitudes, even as we get older, Lord. We, that's even worse as we get older. We just need to always be reminded of your word and uh, guard our hearts. Pray your blessing upon our uh, Burmese friends. Protect them in Burma. Oh, God, may you give victory to those that are trying to put down this corrupt government. We pray your blessing in India among all the Christians that you have boldness. And, and the same in Vietnam, that the Christians would have a holy boldness to stand up and preach Christ. Thank you for your love and mercy. Thank you for this church. In Jesus' name, amen.